Let's talk about tap water. And here I have to take a deep breath, not a deep gulp, but a deep breath, because in researching tap water and what's contained in tap water in different regions, not just in the US, but around the world, I confess the picture is a pretty scary one. I want to be clear, I'm not somebody who naturally orients towards fear or conspiracy theories. However, in researching tap water for this episode, by way of looking at the peer-reviewed research, meta-analyses, reviews, specific research articles where specific hypotheses were tested, and in talking with experts in toxicology, and so on. It's a pretty grim picture when one looks at what's contained in most tap water and whether or not compounds that are contained in tap water are present in sufficient concentrations to negatively impact our health. And the bad news is that much, if not all tap water, contains things that are bad for the biology of our cells. There is a silver lining, however, and the silver lining is that very simple steps that are very inexpensive can be used to adjust that tap water to make it not just safe to drink, but that makes it perfectly fine to drink. So that's the good news, and we'll get to that in a moment. If you are somebody who is interested in whether or not tap water contains things like endocrine disruptors, hormone disruptors that can negatively impact reproductive health in males or females or both, it's a wonderful review, wonderful because it's so thorough, although the news isn't great, it's very thorough, which is great, which is entitled Endocrine Disruptors in Water and Their Effects on the Reproductive System. This is a review from 2020, analyzes water from a bunch of different sources within the world and essentially focuses on a few key components. First of all, it focuses on the concentration of minerals, that is magnesium and calcium within water. Many people don't realize this, but so-called hard water sounds terrible, right? But hard water is water that contains magnesium and calcium, which turns out to be a good thing. Some water contains more magnesium and calcium. Other water contains less. They looked at the presence of magnesium and calcium because that is going to impact the pH of water. In general, the higher concentrations of magnesium and calcium in water, the higher the pH. That is, the more alkaline that water is and the lower levels of magnesium and calcium, more acidic or lower pH that water tends to be. The other thing that this review addresses is the concentration of so-called DBPs, which are disinfection byproducts contained in water. Obviously, local governments want your drinking water to be clean. They don't want contaminants in it. They don't want sewage in that water. They don't want chemical contaminants that are going to make people immediately sick. So they treat water, water treatment plants, treat water with disinfection products. And those disinfection products create things called disinfection byproducts. And the presence of those DBPs or disinfectant byproducts can strongly impact the pH of water by way of changing the concentrations of magnesium and calcium. I do believe that governments are trying to provide people with clean water, but in doing so, oftentimes we'll introduce things to that water that are not good for us. Very clear that DBPs have been shown to disrupt ovarian function, spermatogenesis, and fertility outcomes, even at concentrations of DBPs that are present in drinking water that comes from the tap. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't drink tap water? Well, the answer to that is a, it depends. What does it depend on? Well, it depends on several things. First of all, I highly recommend that everybody go online and put in your zip code and ask for a water analysis of water that comes out of the tap in that zip code. Now, of course, you're going to get a bunch of values back. And unless you're a toxicologist, probably not going to know what those values mean. What you're really looking for is whether or not there are high, low, or moderate levels of fluoride in that drinking water. Why do I say that? Well, there are studies that show that the concentration of fluoride in drinking water is of particular concern for the thyroid hormone system of the body. Now, thyroid hormone has a lot of different roles in brain and body, and thyroid hormone is very important important for everything from metabolism to levels of energy and thyroid levels are disrupted or if thyroid receptors are disrupted, it can lead to depression and thyroid hormones are optimized. It can lead to optimal mood. In other words, it helps keep your mood elevated. It relates to everything from sleep to reproduction. Thyroid hormone is involved in many, many things, including bone health and tissue health generally. So essentially every biological process in your body is impacted by thyroid hormone. But leaving that aside, it seems to me that most everybody should know how much fluoride is in their drinking water. And ideally everybody, yes, everybody is filtering their drinking water. Now that raises the question of how best to filter drinking water. And that brings an answer of, it depends on a couple of things. First of all, how healthy or unhealthy do you know yourself to be. So if you're somebody who has no health issues, you have plenty of vigor, you're sleeping well at night, you have no autoimmune disease, you're not aware of any health concern, minor or major, well then perhaps you're somebody that doesn't want to filter your water. I would argue that why wouldn't you employ some very low or even zero cost approach to filtering your water? There are going to be other individuals who are suffering particular ailments of brain or body or both that absolutely should be filtering their drinking water if they're drinking the water from their tap because it is pretty well established now that tap water 
water contains a lot of these disinfectant byproducts, as well as in most cases, exceeding the threshold of fluoride that we know to be healthy for us. How should you filter your tap water? Well, you have everything ranging from so-called Brita type filters. So these are going to be carbon type filters or other filters. You essentially put over a container or a compartment where you can pour the water over it and goes into the compartment below. Will those work? Are they sufficient to filter out the disinfectant byproducts? The general answer is yes, provided you change the filters often enough. However, it is not thought that they filter out sufficient fluoride. So what I highly recommend is depending on your budget, you go online and you search for at-home water filters that can filter out fluoride. There are a number of straightforward and inexpensive. You can't really put all the drinking water that you would use, say, for an entire week or for an entire month in one pitcher. You're going to have to repeatedly pour water into the pitcher in order to filter it. An important note about filtration, just as in our body, there are mechanisms to signal mechanical changes and chemical changes that occur in our gut, in our brain, et cetera, elsewhere. And in general, both mechanical and chemical changes are signaled across the body to invoke different changes, whether or not those are you know, a response of the immune system or to make us more alert or more asleep, et cetera. So too, filtration capitalizes on mechanical and chemical filtration. What I mean by that is when you run fluid, water or any other fluid through a filter, those filters are doing two things. They are physically constraining which molecules can go through by creating portals, pores that allow certain size molecules to go through and not others. And almost always they contain certain chemicals themselves, right? Those filters have been treated with certain chemicals that neutralize certain other chemicals. Okay. So you may be wondering how, when you filter water, magnesium and calcium could get through, but fluoride doesn't. And that's because these filters have been very cleverly designed in order to neutralize fluoride or to prevent large molecules such as sediment and dirt, which is kind of easy to imagine being filtered, but also to allow certain small molecules like calcium, which is small-ish, or magnesium, which is smallish, to still pass through into our drinking water. So on the topic of magnesium and calcium, this relates, as I mentioned earlier, to the quote-unquote hardness of water. So what of the hardness of water? You know, is it better to have more magnesium and calcium in your water or less? Some people don't like the taste of hard water. They prefer a taste of water that has less magnesium and calcium. However, there I would encourage you to take a step back and consider some of the literature. In fact, um, I'll mention a paper in particular now published in 2019, which describes the quote, regulations for calcium, magnesium, or hardness in drinking water in the European Union member states. Turns out in Europe, they do very detailed wa water analysis. This was a paper published in Regulatory Toxicology and Pharmacology. And they cite a number of different references in the introduction that for instance, and here I'm, I'm quoting, statistically significant significant inverse association between magnesium and cardiovascular mortality. Again, that's an association. This is not causal. Higher magnesium in water, lower cardiovascular mortality. They go on to say the highest exposure category, which are people consuming drinking water with magnesium contents of 8.3 to 19.4 milligrams per liter. Again, when you get your water analysis, you can um, compare against some of these values. Was significantly associated with decreased likelihood of cardiovascular mortality by 25% compared with people consuming magnesium content of who 0.5 to 8.2 milligrams per liter. Basically states is that higher magnesium and calcium in containing water, so-called harder water, may not taste as good to you. It turns out to be better for you. Now, whether or not it can prevent you from getting cardiovascular disease, don't know. In fact, I would probably just state no. It probably won't prevent you from cardiovascular disease. You still need to do all the other things that are important for avoiding cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease. This ought to raise a very important question in all of your minds, which is why is it that magnesium and calcium concentrations are relevant to cardiovascular disease? Is it something about what magnesium does in cells or what calcium does in cells. Are we all magnesium and calcium deficient? Well, it turns out that's not the case. The major effect by which magnesium and calcium in water are likely to impact things like blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and other aspects of cellular function turn out to be somewhat cryptic, but we can make that cryptic aspect very clear by saying that when you have more magnesium in particular, but also calcium present in our water, so-called hard water, you increase the amount of hydrogen in that water. It becomes what we call hydrogen rich. And the pH of that water is increased. Again, this does not mean that we are trying to change the pH of the cells of our body in any kind of meaningful way. In fact, we don't want to do that. We want the pH of the cells of our body to stay in particular ranges, as I mentioned earlier. But having more magnesium, more calcium in our water, that is increasing the hardness of our water, changes the pH of that water. And it turns out that the elevated pH of water, that is pH of water that tends to be somewhere between high sevens, so we could say 7.9, Nine, up to even nine or 9.2 is going to be more readily absorbed and is going to more favorably impact function of our cells than lower 
pH water. And I want to restate this because I'm a little bit concerned that someone will get the impression that I'm saying that we actually want to drink high pH water. We all need to buy expensive high pH water. Turns out that's not the case. If you are consuming tap water from a location where levels of magnesium are sufficiently high in that tap water, again, where the level of magnesium is 8.3 to 19.4 milligrams per liter of water, that is if the water coming out of your tap is hard enough, well then chances are you don't need to enhance the pH of that water or change its magnesium concentration. If, however, the water that you're drinking from the tap, filtered or not, I would hope filtered, contains less than 8.3 milligrams per liter of magnesium, well, then chances are the pH of that water is going to be low enough that it's not going to be lending itself to some of the favorable health components that higher pH water can. Notice I did not say that lower pH, aka more acidic water, is bad for you. I didn't say that. I said that higher pH water can be good for you. 